Okay, so like yesterday, uh, where we had uh, our training, introduction training for uh, basic usage of MISP. Um, today with this session, again, you won't become MISP expert. Um, but the idea is to give you like the basic knowledge to administer the application uh, and start automating things and integrating things. Okay, so the agenda for the day, uh, Alex already pasted in the chat <clears throat> this training document that has a lot of information. So in this document, you can find the training instance, uh, the demo training instance that you can uh, use uh, for playing. So just click on the link and use this uh, username password combination uh, so that <laughs> you can like start playing with the instance. Just be aware that this training instance will be open for at least seven days uh, so that you can show your colleagues, you can continue playing with the instance. Um, but after these seven days, uh, we won't guarantee that the password will still work. So we are at day two of this uh, public MIST training. And day two is about advanced session that will cover administration, but also API and a bit of MISP internals. If you want to see the detailed agenda, it's all at the bottom. And you can see that we will start today with administration, where we'll talk about ACL and ownerships and more or less how data belong to users uh, and organization, uh, the different roles that we have, different type of users and so on. Okay. So let's start. So we'll just log into that instance, the training instance. And we'll start having a look at the administration tab. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, the users you are being given, they don't have the privilege. No, you don't. You don't have the privilege to, to access this, uh, this page. So sorry about that. That's uh, something to change for next time. So we we'll just have to have a look uh, at what I'm doing. So let, let's start with organization. So organization in MISP, this is like the, the entity that will contain many users. So if you remember from the session yesterday, you were creating events, as you can see on this one, user 67 created that in that event. And you can see that automatically the creator organization was assigned to that event. So see, if I click on this event, you can see that the creator has this event as assigned to, to that organization. Okay. So in this instance, in the training instance, we have uh, 10 organization, org one, two, six, one demo org, one main org. This is the org where uh, uh, that you were using. See, it has like 110 users. And the uh, admin organization called org name, which is the one I'm currently using. And in addition to that, we also have the circle organization. Okay, so what is an org? So let's quickly see what you can do with an organization when you try to add an organization. You have many fields that you can uh, like provide value to, but actually only one is really required and it's just the organization identifier. So this is simply the, the name of the organization. Um, like if we were to say, I don't know, a big organization like uh, NC3, which is another department from the parent company of uh, for, uh, for which I'm working for, um, I just pick an identifier. I need to generate a new ID. So UID is very important. Uh, we'll talk a lot about this UID today. And that's basically it. I'm good to go. I can just submit. And MISP will create an organization for me with that UID and that name. Now, obviously, we have other optional fields for which you can uh, provide like a description of that organization. You can enforce users 
to have an email address that is uh, under a specific domain. For example, if I want to enforce that any user for that organization have to have an email address that ends with nc3.lu, that is something that I can absolutely do. All right. And then additional stuff like nationality, sector, type of organization, and so on. So if we have a look at an existing organization like the Circle one, we can see that the name of that organization is simply Circle. The UID is this one. Uh, we have a small description about that organization saying that Circle is the third uh, in Luxembourg for uh, private sector coming in non-governmental entities. And in this organization, we have many users. So for example, Alexandre Dulonois, which is uh, here in the chat today with us. Uh, we have my user as well that is in this organization. We have Luciano, which is also in the chat with us today. So all these users, they are tied to the Circle organization, meaning that whenever they will create data, such as event, this, this event will be like assigned the Circle organization. All right. So that's more or less it for the organization. We'll come back to the local and remote part when we'll talk about synchronization. But for now, let's just uh, leave it as is. And let's go to the next topic, which is users. So users, pretty basic. basic uh, as you would expect, users allows you to like log in into the system. And once again, you can see that they are tied to an organization. This is pretty standard. So let's see how you can create a user. So to do that, just click on add user. And then you have to provide a bit of information. So an email address could be test at test or test. You can decide to set the password or not. If you don't set the password, um, password will be randomly generated and it will be sent uh, encrypted by using the PGP key of that users uh, by email. So if I were to use uh, a valid email address like this. I can fetch the PGP key. So I'm clicking the button. It will take the email address, do a PGP lookup on the key. I can just select this one and automatically it gets pre-filled. So that's pretty handy. Now, if I create that user, as I didn't set the password, a randomly generated password will be sent to me and uh, I will be able to change it the first time I log into the application. Okay, so for this one, I will just set up a random password. Actually, there is no point in creating an event, a uh, user, so I just leave it as is. Then, I've already said many times, you have to choose to which organization this user is tied to. So in this case, we could select any of these organizations, so I can say this, this test user belongs to the team organization. And then I have to choose a role. Role, that's the next topic on the agenda. So you have many roles. These are the roles that exist by default uh, in MISP. So when you install MISP, these are the roles that will be available to you. You can, of course, create new roles with other permissions, but these are like the most used and most basic roles that you have. So you have admin. Admin or basically super admin of the application. They can do whatever they want. They can create users, they can remove users, they can create data, they can modify data for the organization and so on. They're basically super admins. So usually you don't assign the admin role to anyone. The next one is org admin. Org admin means that um, it is the administrator of a specific organization. So typically the process is when you create a new organization, you, you will be given the org admin role so that you can create users, but only for your organization. So uh, in the case of Circle, uh, we have all admins, so super admin of the, of the application. So this is not uh, that interesting. In case of org one, you can see that we have one user that is the org admin, another one which is a user, and a third one which is a sync user. We'll come to that later on. But basically, the org admin is the role that allows uh, user one at org admin dot one test to create new user for that organization.
Then you have more optional fields like the PGP key. Uh, uh, and if you use uh, export for uh, intrusion detection system, you can also set uh, an IDS number. And then more option like to subscribe to notifications such as emailing, uh, to send credentials automatically or to disable a user. So once you're happy with that, you click on create user and you have your user created. So see, if a user is created, you can even subscribe to more notification. Okay. So that's it for users. And now let's jump to roles. So this, this is the list of roles. So you might remember the, we saw them like a few minutes ago, the admin, org admin, user, publisher, sync user, read only. These are roles that uh, have a lot of different like permissions. For example, the org admin, you can see that it has the org admin permission. Um, it also has some audit action, like many of the other roles. Um, an org admin in this instance can also edit tags. So if you remember from the presentation yesterday, you can create custom tags, like we call them free tags, and an org admin can create these tags. Um, an org admin can also like edit and create sharing groups uh, in opposite to a regular user. So you can see it has many different permissions that regular users. In addition to that, you can see on the right side, we have different uh, limits that are uh, enforced for a specific session. Like a user in this case has a memory limit of two gigs, meaning that whenever a user performs an operation on the application, it cannot go over two gigs. Otherwise, the application will, will terminate the, uh, the, um, the connection and uh, received an error. Um, we have a similar concept, but instead this time of uh, memory limits, it's about execution time. So if a process that a user start takes more than 200 seconds, then it will be terminated as well. And last but not least, we also have some kind of uh, rate limiting system that is only available on one specific endpoint. We will cover it during the API session. This uh, endpoint is the REST search. So it's basically the API that allows you to filter and export all the data in MISP. Um, and for this specific endpoint, you can enforce uh, like a rate limiting. So why this, this endpoint and not the other? Because this is the like the most intensive in terms of resource uh, endpoint that we have in the application. So it's to make sure that uh, people uh, are not uh, abusing the system. Okay, but obviously, if you are not happy with these settings, you can always edit them. Like, for example, if you want to give more uh, execution time and memory limit to the organ mean, you can simply click on the edit, and you can change the memory and the execution time. We can even give more permission to that uh, to that role. I click on edit, and now I've added more permissions. You can also create new roles. Simply click on add role. And you have the same form than the edit one. So you could create a, a new role. You give it some special permission. Can this role manage its own event? Can this role manage all the event from the organization? Can give a memory and execution time. And then you can also specify which permission, additional permission that role can have. Click Submit, and you created the role. All right. So see users, roles, and organization in MISP is, I don't think it's that complex, as long as you understand that a user has only one role, and this role has some permission associated to it. And also that user, they always belong to an organization, so you, you don't have user without organization. So if you go in the list of users, you can see they, all, they are always assigned to an organization. 
And finally, whenever you create data, specifically events and its attributes and object and so on, they don't belong to a user, but they, this data belong to an organization. And it's pretty straightforward to see that we see that the organization that creates uh, the data is, well, it's based on the organization, not the user. Okay, so that's more or less it for the SLN ownership part. Now for the a more complex topic, now we'll talk a bit about um, synchronization. In synchronization, we have two ways to get data. So the first one, we will we could call it uh, server synchronization. Uh, this is uh, the mechanism that MISP uses to like push information or to send information to other MISP servers, but also to pull and or, or download information for other MISP, from other MISP servers. So we call that a remote server or server synchronization. And we have a similar concept with, uh, with feeds, uh, but in this case, it's only pulling, so downloading data, where MISP can subscribe to a feed and uh, simply go to that feed, downloads it, and save it locally. And we will see the difference between the two and the most important option that you can uh, use using these two. At first, let's start with servers. So on the server index, you see all the other MISP instance for which, first of all, we know about, and also for which we have a connection to. So this training instance, uh, I will also call it the main instance, and you might now understand why your user is belong to the organization orc main, because the instance we are in is basically the, the main training instance. And these four instances, there are also training instances, namely one, two, three, and four. And you can see we also have the associated organization one, two, three, and four. So on this screen, uh, you see all well, the configuration that uh, we have for each server. And I think the most used functionality on the screen is the run connection button. So the connection test button, click on run. It does uh, a compatibility check, a connection check. Um, so you can see the local version, you can see the remote version. You can see the status, if it's okay, it means you're good to go. You can fully synchronize uh, in both direction. Uh, also that tells you the compatibility, which most of the time will also be green, especially for case set. And the last one, which might be weird, is that we also is doing what you call a post test. So we are sending a, a huge text uh, to that instance, and we expect that instance to reflect that text back. And if the two texts are exactly the same, then the post test is a success and uh, we make it like, like uh, it's valid. And the reason why we are doing that is sometimes you know, people add uh, like a proxy in front of their MISP instance and this proxy sometimes it truncates the data. So it's, if that ever happened uh, to you that you don't get why you don't fully synchronize information or uh, that in synchronization simply doesn't work, just take the time to do uh, connection test, and if the post-test fails, then you know for sure that you have something weird going on with most probably your proxy. You can also check the remote user that is being used for that instance. So if we click on view, you can see that on MISP1, I have a user called user1 at sync-user.main.test, and this sync user has the role of a sync user, and it has the sync flag set. So I haven't talked about synchronization and sync flags, but we'll come to that. Um, so this is like nifty uh, feature to also double check which user is being used on the remote instance. Then you can also reset API keys, uh, and then you have all the different synchronization options that you can enable or disable. And uh, yep, the URL on the remote instance, and so on. 
So let's have a look at uh, how you can create a new connection. But I think instead of starting from a blank one, let's actually edit the connection to see how it's actually filled. So right now I'm currently viewing the configuration for the synchronization between mist main and training one .org. So this is the URL of the instance. So if I'm trying to access this one, you can see that this is training instance one. So we actually have a training instance that's running there. And the instance name is just a friendly name that I can give to my instance. So I could say uh, like training instance, training instance misp1. I just called it misp underscore one. So just a friendly identifier that is used in only one place. Well, two places. The first one is the list of server that you have the name there. And the second is when you have a correlation between server, we don't have one in, in this case, but when you have correlation between server, a new panel would open and you would see the name of the remote server that has a correlation with that event. And then the most important part uh, when setting up the synchronization is for you to set up the instance ownership and the credentials. So for that, uh, I also realized that I forgot to share with you something really cool yesterday, which is called a cheat sheet. Just hold on. We'll share the link in the chat as well. Okay, so this cheat sheet, uh, it's a good reminder of what we saw yesterday, but it also has more information. So it's basically multiple topics. The first one is about the like MISP concept that includes uh, different terminology that I use through, throughout the training. Same, a quick reminder about the distribution, an explanation on how synchronization works. We'll come to that in, in a minute what I call the data model cheat sheet. So it explains uh, the different data structure that we have in MISP to encode information, for example, event, what is the purpose of event, what are the use cases, and some additional notes. And at the end, something that we will also cover later today is the user and administrator cheat sheets. So that gives you some uh, like cheat sheet for extracting information using various things and then mistering your MISP instance, such as resetting passwords, for example, or rem removing the boot force logging protection. All right. So let's have a look at this small diagram. In this case, we have two MISP instances. We have MISP1 and MISP2. Um, and for you, in order to have a synchronization between the two. Uh, in this case, we are looking at MISP1 having a synchronization access to MISP2. MISP1 needs to have a user on MISP2, right? Because if MISP1 doesn't have a user on MISP2, then MISP1 cannot prove that it can access MISP2. So that's how we actually give authorization to remote instances, right? So in our case, In our case, when we set up a synchronization between MISP main and MISP1, MISP main, this instance, needs to have a user on MISP1. And that user needs to generate an authorization key that we'll put there. And so now MISP main, now that it has access to the user on MISP1, MISP main can use the authorization key of the user in MISP1 to actually interact with uh, the data on MISP1. So that's what this uh, diagram tries to show you, that we have a user in MISP2 in this case, uh, that is being used by MISP1. Okay. 
But in addition to that, we also have to set who owns the remote instance. So in this case, uh, it's not shown in the diagram, but basically org1, so this organization, is the owner of MISP1. Org2 is the owner of MISP2. Org main is the owner of our training organization. And for example, Circle. Circle is the owner of many instances. Like we have an instance for the private sector called uh, misbrief.circle.lu. This instance, Circle is the owner of that instance. So if we were to set up a synchronization link between Miss Main and Miss Brief, then we would use Circle as the owner of that remote instance. So it's very important that you set this correctly uh, because this is used uh, when we are synchronizing data under sharing groups. So the issue, if you were to, instead of using Orc1, you were to use Orc main, what would happen in this case is that you might send more information to the remote instance when it comes to sharing groups. So that's where things can go wrong, basically. So if you are not using sharing group, it doesn't really matter, but I think it's a matter of good practice to ensure that you assign the correct ownership to uh, to the training instance that is uh, remotely there. So in this case, we leave it as Orc1. Okay, uh, we'll come to that local and external Orc later on. Then you put the authorization key there. Uh, you select the synchronization that you want to use. We'll call uh, talk to that in a minute. And then once you're good, you click Submit. And there, at that point, you can check that you have access to the server. And you can check that the API key is uh, the one of the user you actually expect uh, to be on the remote instance. All right, so let's quickly see the different synchronization options that we have. And for that, I will go back to my diagram and show you that we have two synchronization mechanisms, namely push and pull. So in this case, on MISP1, we have created a synchronization link to MISP2. And MISP1 can use a user on MISP2 to like manipulate data on MISP2. So MISP1 can first pull information from MISP2. So that means MISP1 can use the user it has on MISP2 and download all events that that, that user has access to and save them in MISP1. So that's the most typical way to synchronize stuff is just to pull anything that is remotely there. So in our case, if I want to download all the information that is on MISP1, I can just click this button pull all, and my MISP will connect to MISP2 and download everything. So the other synchronization mechanism that we have is push, and it's completely the opposite. So instead of downloading information, we send information to the, to the other instance. So if I'm connecting, once again on this one, and I click this button, push all, MISP1 will collect all the events that should be pushed to MISP2, and one by one, it will send all events to MISP2. So these are the two synchronization mechanisms. And this uh, push and pull, you can see that it's only a one, uh, like I like to call it, um, a one-way synchronization link. Because it looks like it's two-way, but it's actually only one because MISP1 can push data and pull data from MISP2. But you can see in this case, MISP2 cannot pull data from MISP1 and MISP2 cannot push data to MISP1. So if you if you want to have this two-way uh, synchronization link, MISP1 has to create a user on MISP1 for MISP2 that MISP2 can then later use to pull information or push information to and from MISP1. All right. So you can pull, you can push, 
if you can pull information, that means you can view that information. And that's exactly what you can do if you click on the magnifying glass. So this is the explore functionality. If I click on this one, what I'm actually doing, and it's pretty obvious uh, in the user interface, I'm simply viewing all the events on the remote instance MISP1. And you can see we only have two events over there. See, on this one, we have 16. But on MISP1, we only have two. So I can also explore these events. So if I want to see what is inside this event, I can just click on the view. And I don't mind the debug messages. This is a training instance. Uh, but yeah, I can just explore. So you see, it really looks like it's an event in my main instance, but I'm simply viewing a remote event on another MISP instance. So if I think that this event, it's a really cool event and I want to have it locally, instead of downloading all the information that is on MISP1, I can also cherry pick these events that I found, find interesting and save them locally. And you can do that by just clicking on this fetch event button. So if I click on this button, I will simply download that event on my MISP instance. There is no point in doing it because this event already exists on my instance and this is an event that was created by one of you. You can see ID 32. Okay. So what else can we do? So we can push, we can pull, we can push sightings. Sightings, if you remember, we talked about it quickly yesterday. But sightings allows you to say that you've seen something or that something is a false positive. So when you set up synchronization link, you can also decide if you want to push these sightings or not. Um, you can also decide if you want to cache that remote instance or not. Uh, we'll talk about caching a lot in the, the feed section, but basically caching it allows you to have a local cache of whatever is on the remote side without downloading everything locally so that you have access to the correlation. So, for example, I could simply enable caching for this one. See, it's not cached, and I can start a cache job. To wait a bit. There we go. Now we have cached everything that is on this one. And if I look at other events, now you can see, oh, we know about uh, MISP1. And this, we see a correlation that this event has with some other event hosted on MISP1. Okay, we can see that this is the attribute that correlates. All of these, they correlates as well. It's also a good way to see that you have correlation both on the on one MISP instance, but also you can see correlation across multiple MISP instances. Now you might wonder what's the difference between caching data and downloading it locally. Why wouldn't why wouldn't I download everything so that I have everything locally? Well, the main reason is if you have huge instances. Uh, that contains a lot of junk data. This is data that you don't necessarily want to pollute your own MISP instance. One use case that we are doing at Circle, for example, is we have uh, a MISP instance dedicated to like all the phishing that we receive. So this one, it has a lot of junk, a lot of data, and we don't want to have that all of the data in our production system. So what we do, we simply cache all the data on that remote instance so that if in our production instance, when we do trend intelligence, we see a correlation with one of the phishing on another MISP instance, on the junkyard, like we call it, uh, then we know that this event on the junkyard, it's maybe interesting to have a look at. So in that case, I could just simply explore that instance, collect the event. And if I think that this event is very interesting, I can choose to download it locally and then share it with the community. So that's the main purpose of caching. Then we have something that we didn't talk about. Uh, it's uh, pushing and pulling galaxy clusters. So you remember galaxies and galaxy clusters, these are context 
uh, that you can attach to event and attributes. But something that we didn't cover yesterday is that these clusters, you can also create new clusters. You can also fork them and so on. And so when you do that, you also have the possibility to push uh, and pull them to and from other MISP instances. And you have exactly the same functionality for analysis data. If you remember analysis data, this is the mechanism that allows you to add a note or add an opinion on, for example, an event uh, or um, an attribute. I remember I used one of them. Uh, list analysis data. Yep. This one. So this one is attached to doesn't say. Okay. This one is attached to an attribute. There we go. This one. So remember this this opinion and this uh, uh, note, we created them yesterday. So this information by default, when you create a synchronization, the checkbox is not checked. So if you want to also push or pull analysis data from other MISP instances, you have to enable these synchronization methods. And we have a bunch of different settings. Like you can force event to be in the unpublished state on the remote server. You can also publish without sending emails can skip proxies and so on, provide server or client certificates. But I think the most important are the two last ones, the push and pull rules. So I will quickly explain what these are. You remember this uh, filter interface where you can like provide some filters to filter your event index? For example, you can say that uh, I only want uh, event that uh, were published, not very practical, but let's go with it. Um, like from the 1st of January, let's say. And I also want to have any event that are tagged with TLP screen. So these filters, that I've just uh, applied on this event index, I can use the same. I can use the same when I um, create a synchronization rule. Because so far I, I told you that you can download everything from a remote instance, but that's not true because you can also filter what you want to download exactly. So we are talking about downloading, so that means I'm talking about the pool uh, mechanism, synchronization mechanism. So if I click on the pool rules button that we have there, I can specify some filtering that I want to be applied whenever I'm pulling data. For example, I can say that I want only events that are marked with TLP green to be uh, pulled. I can also mark that I don't want anything mark TLP red to be pulled. So you see you have this uh, allow tags and block tags. If you don't like any, if you don't like malwares, uh, you can say that you don't want anything that is related, that is tagged with malware content, for example. So you can do that for tags, which is the most used synchronization filters, but you also have the possibility with organization for example, let's say that you you really like what Orc 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are doing, but you think Circle is producing way too, man, too much junk uh, for your taste. So you can also allow all these organizations and block anything that has been created by Circle. All right. If you update, then you see you would have all these rules applied. And now, if you go back on the index, you can see that pool is enabled, but we have some rules there. And if you click on it, you can see what are these rules. But you can go even further. 
and it's with this additional sync parameters and it's a based on the event index filters and this is what we did there with the filtering there so basically in there you can provide more filters uh, to be applied during synchronization for example oops, search public timestamp and then i can take the exact value just need to remove the encoding. There we go. Almost. There we go. And so in that case, anything that were published before that date won't be pulled. So all of these sync parameters will have a closer look at what you can set in there during the API session. All right, so we'll quickly get rid of these rules. Oops. 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 Hey, cool. All right, so let's check. I don't see any question in the chat, so uh, I guess everything is more or less clear. At least ho I hope it is. Um, now, to continue on the synchronization aspect, we'll have a small discussion about something that uh, uh, is quite interesting. It's about data deletion. So let's say that I create my event, and we create a sensitive sensitive incident and I put this uh, incident as uh, let's say connected communities then for this incident oh, I will add person I will add passport number I don't know if we have validation for that no we don't okay so I've created something that is very sensitive, something that you wouldn't want to share like publicly. So something that you would probably only share with really some specific organization or even not share at all and keep it for yourself. But let's say that you you, you did that <clears throat> and then you publish that event. So you can see the event will be pushed because we choose the distribution level connected communities. And then later on in the day, you go back to that event and you realize, oh, that was connected communities. I thought it was the organization only. So let's quickly remove that uh, attribute. Okay, I will quickly remove it. Now, as I removed it, the event is not published anymore. So I will quickly publish it again. And there we go. Now you might think, okay, finally, I undo my mistake. I didn't share or leak that information, that passport number information. I'm good to go. But that's actually not true. Because even though it looks like the attribute was deleted, it's not really deleted. It's actually what we call soft deleted. And what's more, if you deleted it by mistake, you can choose to actually restore that information. So now it's restored. And if I go on the other MISP instances, like training one, you can see that, oh, sensitive incident is there. Even though it might, it might look empty, you can see that I can still see the deleted attribute on this other instance. So you see deletion in MISP doesn't work like you would think it works. Because, um, because of this peer-to-peer -peer nature of uh, synchronization links uh, that we have, we don't have the real concept of true deletion. So we have two concepts of deletion. We have what we call soft deletion and art deletion. So you see, when I try to delete something, it says that we are about to soft delete that attribute. So that means that it will not 
be purged, so it will not be removed from the database. And uh, what actually happens behind the scenes is we just set a flag on that attribute and we say that this attribute is marked for deletion and that shouldn't be displayed on the screen and that shouldn't be exported when you export uh, rules for IDS system or firewalls or whatever. But this information, like this revocation information, need to, needs to be propagated to other VISP instances. And so if you were just to remove, like to really remove it from the database, then you wouldn't be able to tell other VISP instances that this attribute should be removed. So what you actually have to do is to convey the revocation of that attribute to these other VISP instances. And the only way to do it is to pass a revocation flag. Okay. So in our sensitive incident case, uh, if you really have leaked something that you shouldn't have, we also have a setting that allows you to a bit of uh, obfuscate um, the original value. So I don't remember exactly how it's called. Uh, maybe it's in security. Maybe sanitize. Ah, there we go. Sanitize attribute on delete. So let's turn it to true and let's see what happens. I just need to restore that attribute. There we go. Then I delete it again. Now you can see if I look at deleted, look at the value, now it's deleted. And if I push my change and I look on on this turning one, so the other instance, if I look at it, now I can see that the attribute has been someone somehow like sanitized, or at least the original value is no longer visible, like the passport number is no longer visible. So that's there is a way in MISP to like mitigate that, um, but it's only like a partial mitigation. When I say partial mitigation, I mean it's a mitigation for normal users, but it's not a full mitigation for administrators because this administrator they still have access to the logs. For example, they can have a look at the audit logs that shows um, anything that happened on that instance. And you can see, uh, through synchronization, we receive the passport number and we have the value of the passport number. We even see that through synchronization, again, that passport attribute was removed. You can see the deleted flag going from zero to one. And then you can see that afterward, that uh, passport got like sanitized. You can see the type change to comment and the value changed to delete it. So you can see in the logs, which is only which are only available to site admins, so super admin of the instance, uh, you can see all the changes. But from a regular user perspective, they just simply see the sanitized version of it. Okay. So that was a small discussion about deletion in MISP. Now, let's continue on that deletion aspect, but instead, this time, we will not talk about uh, attributes. I will restore it, this one quickly. What are we even do this? We have both in instances on each side. So on the left side, we have the main, and on the right side, we have a training one. So now we can see that we undeleted the attribute and they all have the same value. So you saw that deletion for attribute, it's working uh, like the way we just explained. But what about events? So let's say that I, on this one, I decide to delete an event. So we just delete this incident, sensitive incident. And now if I try to, I don't know, 
add a new attribute. And I publish this event. You can see that it will be published on this one. So what would happen on the right side? So two things can happen. Either this event get created once again on the right side, or it doesn't get recreated at all. And if you look what happened, it wasn't recreated at all. But the interesting thing is that MISP1, it might receive the event from another source than the main MISP instance. If you remember, we have, oh, oops, remote server. We have many MISP instance, mis instances uh, uh, synchronization connection. And if MISP1 is connected to MISP2, uh, MISP1 uh, would receive that event through MISP2, in addition to receive it through MISP main. Because remember, MISP for synchronization, MISP, you can view it as a peer to peer system where event can flow left and right. So the path that uh, an event uh, might take whenever you synchronize it might not be the same every time. But the reason why this event wasn't created on MISP1 is because whenever you delete data, it actually ends up in what we call a block list. See? Oops. We have the event info, sensitive incident, comment in that uh, block list entry, automatically blocked by deleting event. So just something to keep in mind whenever you're testing synchronization in MISP. If you delete an event on one MISP instance, it automatically adds an entry in the event block list. So if you want to resynchronize that event again and see the, the outcome of that synchronization, uh, you want, well, you have to remove that uh, block list entry. So now if I remove that entry, go back to my list of events, and publish the event once again. We can see that we got the event back because we removed it from the block list entry. All right. So that's basically it for server synchronization. But we have other synchronization mechanisms. We have feeds. So let's have a quick look at feeds. Um, so feeds, we have, um, let's say, two concepts of feeds. The first one uh, are feeds under a specific format. And the second one is feeds under, let's call it, free text formats or CSV formats. So the first one, for example, the CSV format, you can, in your MISP instance, subscribe to a feed that is hosted online or locally. So if you have a look at this one, I'm not sure if this feed works. So let's check. So you can see this feed is basically just a list of IP addresses uh, that are apparently Tor exit nodes. So what you can do is you can enable this feed What is this, this one? And uh, you can preview that feed. So I'm not sure if there, there are some kind of rate limiting, so I will be, uh, let, let's see. Yeah. And this one is even worse, it's a SSL connection. It's interesting, maybe it's not the correct one. Which one did I take? Take exit. It's doing something. So I'm just previewing what is uh, in this feed. So it's the CSV. And so MISP knows a bit about the format of the CSV that you can define in the settings of the feed. And what MISP is actually doing, it's downloading this, this feed like this and converting each row into its according attribute. So in this case, you can see it created uh, an attribute of type IP destination, right? So I'm just like remotely browsing the feed right now. 
But what you can do, in addition to just like remotely browsing, is you can choose to download it, like to fetch it. And so what happens if you try to fetch this feed? Basically, create an event, and all the attribute that you saw when I was exploring the feed will be created and saved inside that event. But again, again, uh, sometimes you don't want to have that information saved as an event in your MISP instance, especially that kind of feeds that might change uh, on a regular basis. So what would be interesting in this case is instead of downloading that information, you just want to cache it, similar to what we did with the with caching the remote MISP instance. And now what I can do, I can choose to cache that feed. So it's going to be doing its stuff. And if at some point we encode the cache is still ongoing. So if at some point we encode that and uh, the cache finishes, this one, it says not cached. So the job is probably ongoing, but once it's done, you will see like correlation link between the attribute you created and uh, the feed that has been cached. So if we look at the configuration of that feed, Quickly, you can see that we have a name, uh, like a bit of meta information related to that feed, the URL where this feed is hosted, and then the format. So see, we have the MISP format that I will talk in a second, and we have the free text and or simple uh, feed format. These are basically the same. The difference between the two is if you select CSV, um, you can specify which uh, colon uh, is the value. For that specific feed, we use CSV, but we only have actually one row, uh, one column, which is the value. So MISP automatically knows that this is the value. But if you would have like multiple columns, we would have for example, IP and then the, the actual IP and then some meta information or tags, then you can specify which column in that CSV uh, is the value. If you have delimiters, you can also like specify the delimiter and so on. So you have many, many stuff to, to, to choose from. There's just one setting that I think it's important to mention is that Delta merge. Uh, no, actually not this one, sorry. Delta merge goes along with target event. And this is the one I want to talk, target event. So whenever you will pull that feed, I'm not talking about caching, I'm talking about pulling. So downloading that, the, the information stored in that feed locally. You can choose how you want it to be saved. By default, we set it to fixed event, meaning that each time an event, uh, each time this feed will be pulled, the information will be stored inside the same event every time. So the first time you pull that feed, it will create an event and assign that event to that feed. The other mechanism is new event each pull. So each time you pull that feed, for example, the Torx seed node, if you decide to pull it every day, each time you pull it, it will create a new event. So that means if you set it up like this and you pull that Torx seed node feed every day, after one year, you will have created 365 events containing probably the, uh, the same data or at least data that overlaps a lot. This is not optimal at all, as you might guess, because you will create a lot of duplication, you will create a lot of data in your database that doesn't really provide any value. So by default, we set it to fixed event, but in some cases, I think it's pretty rare, but in some cases, it makes sense to decide to uh, create new event each time you pull that feed, if you want to see like tracking changes over time. But I think that's a very specific use case. Okay, now the other MISP uh, feed format that I want to talk about is the MISP feed format. So you can see we have less information uh, that you can assign uh, when you use the MISP uh, feed format. 
let's see for example, this is what the CSV feed for my use to look like. But when you choose Smith feeds, well, you can just simply override a small uh, uh, set of, uh, of meta information. But let's have a look at what the MISP feed format looks like and why it is useful to have this. So by default, when you install a MISP instance, you will have the circle OS in feed available to you, not enabled, but it will be available to you. And you can choose to enable it and download it. And you would, you would get information that we generate for free and for whatever usage you want to do. And let's have a look at what we have when we explore the event of that feed remotely. And you can see it really looks similar to what we were doing when we were exploring uh, remote MISP instances. You have a list of all the events. You can choose to explore an event to see what it contains. Uh, let's take uh, this one. So see a lot of attribute, a lot of object, and so on. And if you think that this event is relevant for that case, we can also decide to download that event locally, similar to what we used to do when we were exploring a remote MISP instance. Okay, but now you might wonder, what's the difference between using a feed and using uh, MISP synchronization? Well, using a MISP on, uh, feed under the MISP format or using simply a MISP server with a synchronization? Well, for us, it's way easier to just expose that to you. This is what actually a uh, MISP under the MISP, form, uh, MISP format looks like. Just an open directory with a lot of JSON files. And with that, you don't have, uh, we don't have to provide you authentication. We don't have to create users for you. And it's way more secure to have like this kind of open directory than having to run a full blown application. So the format is basically each file, each JSON file is actually an event. And uh, we have what we call a manifest.json that uh, contain like all the events and the basic information associated to these events. So for example, this one, this is one of the events. We can see who created that event. We can see the tags that are assigned to that event so that we can perform filtering. Uh, before pulling this event locally. And we have uh, like the title of that event and some uh, information related to when it was created, when it was last modified and so on. These are oh, MISP uh, feed uh, format. Something else that you can do instead of running these feeds using uh, network as a source, can also choose to have the source as local. And what we mean by local is a, a file path on the operating system, like on the server that runs MISP. And instead of the URL, you would just simply provide the path of the directory, like a MISP feed. And then what MISP would do, it, it will go in that directory, uh, download the manifest, and then loads and pull all event one by one. Using the local impute source instead of network is it's how we usually provide synchronization and data updates in aircapped environment. So because in aircapped environment, you cannot issue in like a, a connection to other instances. So that means you cannot issue connection to other MISP instances and you cannot issue connection, connection to a feed that would be hosted online. So to have data uh, to update the data uh, on, on this air gap system, uh, we simply put uh, export all the data as a MISP feed format on a USB key, for example. And then we plug the USB key on the server, we copy over the file, and then we can load all the data using the local and we provide the path on the disk. All right. So, now, next on the agenda is our MISP settings and diagnostic. <clears throat> so I will quickly go over um, how you can like view the different settings that you have in a MISP instance, how you can diagnose uh, the different logs that we have, 
and how you can update your MISP application. So to access the MISP settings, simply go to administration and then click on server settings and maintenance. And then you will have this uh, page uh, that shows the current status of your MISP instance. So we have many tabs. We have the overview one, uh, which gives you like the overall health of your instance. We might be a bit, uh, let's say, aggressive or uh, in panic mode uh, in terms of uh, how we consider the severity of uh, some settings. Uh, but most of them, uh, usually, it's not really critical, as critical as this interface uh, might tell you. Um, then the other tabs, any settings related to MISP. So these are general settings. Uh, we'll have a look at them in a minute. Any settings related to encryption, settings related to proxies, security settings, plugin settings, a lot of other configuration, and the diagnostics page uh, that shows the overall health of your instance by doing a lot of diagnostic on different things. But let's first start with the MISP settings. And um, yeah, so for example, in this section, you would find the language that uh, uh, for which the user interface sh should, should use. Um, like uh, what else could be interesting? Whenever you create an event, the default distribution that should be selected by default, um, some logging, if it should be paranoid or, more, or not. When we say paranoid logging, it just means that we will log a lot of things, like any page request will be logged in the, in the database, so it's extremely verbose, but sometimes it's useful to debug weird behavior or user abusing the system. If you want to log the IPs of the users, um, different things related to database, <coughs> and uh, a lot of UI related stuff. So yeah, I invite you, if you ever install a MISP instance, I invite you to go all these settings and change them to, to your taste. Uh, the next one to always keep encryption and proxy because they are not really interesting, but security is also one of the tabs that you want to review once you have done your installation because there are a lot of aspects for which you can better secure or at least uh, set uh, different settings re related to like <clears throat> uh, security. So by default, we set same values uh, that we recommend. Uh, but in some cases, it, it makes sense to change them. For example, the, the session there, you could uh, decide to use something else. Uh, we really advise to use the PHP one and in PHP configure it so that you use Redis. So it's the one of the best way, but that's how it is. I think that's how it's configured uh, by default when you perform the standard installation. And then yeah, timeout if you want to change them. One of the reasons why you saw this notification and notice messages is because you can see the debug has been enabled on that instance. And uh, yeah, allows you to enable user monitoring. So you see right now it's disabled. That means we are not monitoring what you are doing on that instance. And for example, enabling or disabling email OTP so that you could force users to have OTP enabled and set up correctly in order for them to use the application and force password complexity policy. So see, you have a lot of choice there. For plugins, uh, we will use that interface a lot uh, after the break uh, when we'll do the plugin development section. But basically, MISP, you already guessed, it has a plethora of integration in various ways. For example, we have enrichment system that like, perform queries on third party services and allows you to save additional information in an event or just display that information in the user interface. So in this one, you would have the configuration of all enrichment modules that uh, are available in MISP. See, that there is quite a few. 
Same for the import and export modules. So if you want to convert data into different types, we have a PDF export that convert an event into PDF. We have a export to various total graph that converts an event to various total. So yeah, we also have quite a few that is valid for export and, exp and import. And then other settings. Uh, I won't go through all of them, but maybe... Uh, no, this one we'll see later on anyway. And finally, the diagnostic page. This page takes like a few seconds to load because it's performing a lot of diagnostic on the on the instance. Let's see, we have a lot of checks. And yeah, it gives you an overall look of uh, the current status of your instance. So you can see the instance uh, the version you are currently running, the latest available version. So I can see right now I'm running the latest version, but I'm not running the latest commit. Uh, it says that it's okay. Uh, we can view the version of the submodules. It says that it's all okay. So this is very good. Uh, <clears throat> what I mean by submodules, you remember certainly the taxonomies that we saw yesterday, for example, the TLP taxonomy. Uh, you probably also remember the galaxies, all the, the galaxies that we saw yesterday. All of these concepts, um, they are actually submodules from modern MISP uh, repositories. Uh, so, let's say MISP taxonomies. So this is the GitHub repository of all taxonomies. You can see all of them there. And uh, so whenever you update your MISP, what you also do is you update the submodule. So you update this uh, uh, database, knowledge database of taxonomies. Uh, and this is how we maintain all the libraries in the system. So the galaxies, they also have their own repository. The object templates, they also have their own repository. Same for taxonomies, warning lists, and so on. And the way it works is basically when you update your MISP instance, uh, it will also update the submodules, the respective submodules, and it will load them into the MISP database. Um, then to continue on the diagnostic aspect, uh, MISP will check that uh, it can write to many like directories, we also have a, <clears throat> a good security audit uh, that provides guidance on how you can better secure your system. For example, in our case, we can see that oh, for Redis, uh, maybe you, we should set a password for the Redis uh, database. Um, like it's also said that sensitive information are not encrypted in the database, uh, that uh, for the password, the minimum password length is set to six. And, ask us to increase it so we can see like basic security audits that uh, uh, like steer you in the right direction in better securing your MISP instance. Then if you are having big issues with your MISP instance, it's always good to have a look at PHP settings. So yeah, these are stuff that you, you understand the value once you start having issues with that. Um, and world PHP extension that I've installed, so on. This one, this section, SQL database configuration, this is quite an important one. If you notice you have performance issue with your MISP instance, basically <clears throat> it shows you the, the current uh, setting for these uh, database settings. And it shows you the recommended value that you should set them. So we can see we bumped a bit the InnoDB buffer pool size. Uh, the default is this one. We bumped it a bit, but it's not quite to the value that is recommended there. Obviously, that depends first of all on your system, but also on the usage. If you only have one user that is barely using MISP, maybe there is no point in bumping these numbers. But if you have a lot of users or a lot of usage, it's worth to like optimize uh, your database settings. 
ja. eller när det är en som administra, administration uh, <coughs> action that uh, you can take like on demand actions ok så so that's more or less it for the diagnostic and now last one that I want to show is the worker So you might have noticed in MISP, uh, in some cases, when you do operation, they are not done right away. They are actually done by a background job. And these background jobs, they are basically jobs that are created and workers are waiting for jobs to appear. And once they appear, these workers pick that job up and execute the operation. One of these jobs typically is publishing. So see, if I try to publish that event, you can see The event is not published and MISP tells me that the job has been queued. So what actually happened is we created a job in the priority queue and one of these workers that were just waiting for a job picked that job up and performed the job basically. And what I want to, to actually explain by this interface, I would say 99% of the time you don't really have to have a look at it. But if you think that something is wrong, like you have event not being uh, uh, published or not being synchronized, maybe that's because uh, you have too many jobs in the queue or because probably one of the workers died for whatever reason. And so it's always worth to, to have a quick look at that and fix the issue by just removing the dead worker or starting a new one. All right. Um, another one that might happen a lot is the emailing system. So if you have a lot of users and a lot of events being published, sometimes the emailing queue might get filled up quite uh, quickly. So it's worth, uh, worth uh, uh, starting a new additional worker to help reduce the load. All right. And last point that I want to talk about is about updating your MISP instance with six straightforward or up the, uh, and the, sorry, and the logs. So for the updates, if you have installed your MISP instance correctly, you go in diagnostic, you click on update and you are good to go. It's as simple as that. Um, but that's, uh, is uh, if we, consider the fact that you've installed MISP correctly following the guide and you don't have permission is issues with file and so on. Uh, we know some users that don't like to do like update using UI and they prefer to do update using like the command line. And for that, I will provide the command that you have to run. You can find it in event action and then automation. Then you just search for update and you will see we have this awesome command called update MISP. So you just run that command and it will update MISP automatically. When I say update, that means it will pull the latest changes on the MISP GitHub repository, pull the latest changes on all the sub modules on GitHub, that means all the taxonomies, galaxies, object templates, warning leaks, and so on and so forth. Load everything in the database, perform the database migration so that you are up to date in your database schema and report the status of the update to the user. So it's a lot of stuff and like to facilitate update of MISP, we have provided that small script that does it for you. We'll come back to this uh, automation page and interface after the break. All right, now for the logs. If you hover over the logs, you can see you have different logs. We have four of them. We have the application logs, um, the audit logs, access logs, and the last one is for you to search logs. So audit logs, they will show you any action that modified data in your system. For example, you can see the latest action that were executed is a published action. Remember, I published my event like uh, two minutes ago. And you can see the published state changed. The published timestamp was updated to the current time. 
and I can see for which uh, event this this happened, and I can even see that it was done through a worker. So another one is, for example, this one. This is uh, me that I added an attribute on an event. Uh, I modify a, a feed, uh, published a lot of time this same event, uh, added again another attribute. So you can see on this log anything that uh, that touches or that relates to data modification, whether it is deletion, addition, addition, and other actions such as publication. They will appear in these logs. Very useful to track changes. The other logs are the access logs, which we don't have enabled uh, for that training instance. But basically in there, as you can see on the columns, you, you would see which user with which IP um, <clears throat> and the organization for which that user belonged to uh, perform these operations. And you would see the request that was done, the URL, the code that was written by the server, the memory it used, the duration of the query, and so on. So it's not enabled, so we don't have anything. Uh, but if you enable it, you would see <clears throat> all of this information. Uh, it's basically uh, nicely indexed uh, Apache access logs that you would find. So instead of having to like search in the file, uh, you have it in the database. And the last one, the application logs, it's basically uh, a mix of everything. So it includes uh, like all the logins, the the data that were that were modified, uh, the API usage, and so on. On this instance, we don't have data usage because I I've enabled a setting that really do the segregation between application log and audit logs. But on normal installation, you would see everything mixed in this uh, huge log, uh, log view. So that's why we have compiled for you <clears throat> an interface called search logs, which is very handy whenever you want to search logs, basically. So let's say that we want to view all the logs related to, like, for example, this event. So first I have to choose the model <clears throat> for which I want to for which I want to see the logs. In that case, if I want to see all the logs related to that event, I can just select the event model, put the ID of that model, and then choose any action. So if I want to see every time I did an edit on that event, just choose edit, click on search, and it looks like I never did it. Um, I could do the same, for example, if I choose just to see attributes, get rid of the model ID. And now I can see, for example, that this attribute that I tried to, to create uh, didn't pass the validation. Oh, and this is quite interesting. You might remember this one from yesterday for those who were there. When I try to create an IP address with this, this value, this is obviously... Uh, a wrongly formatted IP address, so it created an entry in the in the logs. Uh, something that is interesting uh, in when you have like these validation errors saved in the logs is if you ingest huge files or use the API, sometimes you won't get all the validation errors, especially if you have like uh, lots of objects and attributes and so on. So if you notice that something is weird. Uh, because all the data wasn't created in your MISP instance, uh, it's worth it to have a look at the logs and to, to check that you don't have validation errors. Okay. And with that, um, I think it's uh, time we do a small break. So we'll do a 15 minute break now. And after that break, we'll have a quick look at uh, deployment option that you have in this integration. So we'll have a look at uh, how to automate stuff using the CLI in MISP, but most importantly, the API, where we will cover two aspects, the MISP API and MISP API, but this time using Python. So we have a Python wrapper called PyMISP uh, that allows you to like manipulate the MISP instance uh, using uh, Python. Uh, we'll see many examples and how you 
can do many, many things. And after that small part, we'll have a look at how you can automate things. So we'll have a look at uh, two features that we have in MISP, uh, one of them being the workflows that allows you to like really uh, automate uh, and generate workflows inside your MISP instance. And we will close the session by having a quick look on how you can create um, an enrichment module in MISP. So what I mean by enrichment module, if you remember, in some cases, you can perform enrichment. We did that yesterday, where you can, uh, I don't know if this one will work, this one doesn't work. So let's take an IP address, Maybe this one. For example, this one, you can, I'm not sure if we have any results. Oh, we do. So with this one, uh, we can do like enrichment. So we take a value and we perform enrichment on that value and we get a response back. And, and the idea is to see uh, together how you can create a new enrichment module. All right, so let's say 15 minutes break now. So see you all at uh, 3.30, no, 3.47 uh, Brussels time. Thank you. All right, welcome back. So, next on the agenda, deployment. We actually took a slide deck and uh, I just realized that this slide deck is slightly outdated. So I will still use it, but it will serve more like as, as a template to steer discussion in that particular direction. All right, so these are the considerations we'll have a look at. The type of deployment, choice of distribution, hardware specification, authentication, and some gotchas. So for deployment type, uh, obviously the native installation, which is uh, something that we heavily maintain. And uh, this is, at least on our case, one of the uh, the way we install it uh, the most frequently. But we also have alternatives. For example, Docker, which is very popular. Um, and yeah, talking about Docker, there are many Dockers uh, available on the web. I mean, if you search for MISP Docker, you will see a lot of uh, results. Um, but I would say one of the, the best one that we have, uh, when I say best, I mean, the one that is the most uh, maintained one is the one that is based on the MISP uh, uh, like, uh, organization page on GitHub called MISP-Docker. So basically it's this one. This one is uh, heavily maintained. Uh, so, I mean, if you, if you don't really know which Docker image uh, to take, I would just take this one. But I mean, Docker, it's a, it's always a bit, a bit big discussion, sorry, because there are many ways that you can create Docker. So you could have one big Docker file that contains all the services. You can have a lot of segregation where you have the MISP application running somewhere, the database running somewhere else, the Regis running somewhere else and so on. So it's most of the time it's a matter of taste, but um, I would say the the official MISP Docker is the same way at least and how you, how I view things. This is a personal opinion. As for distribution, then you can quickly realize that this slide deck is quite old, um, but at the time when it was created, that was the, the the latest operating system at least for Ubuntu. So you just need to bump these numbers to what what is the latest released. Uh, so it's twenty four or four right now, and of course twenty two or four and twenty or four will also work. 
And the latest Ubuntu release is our target platform. This is the one for which we test MISP on a regular basis. Basis, it's part of uh, our CI integration. Uh, so, yeah, if you can choose your distribution, go with Ubuntu. Uh, and especially that's also because that's the platform for which we can support you and help you the best with if you have issues. Uh, but still, we have some support of other platform. Uh, for example, we have uh, an installer for these these other platform with uh, some RPMs uh, that you can also find if you just Google it, uh, just uh, RPM uh, and then you will get uh, the result. Uh, but you can find everything on the website and I'm sure Alex will provide a lot of link in the chat for you. Now, when it comes to hardware specification, uh, so I would say as long as you go with SSDs, yeah, it's uh, it's good enough. Um, so, MISP con can contains a lot of information, of course, and so if you don't have to to do the round trip between your memory and the disk, uh, well, that's a huge time gain. So, if you have SSDs, that will really massively speed up um, anything when it comes to reading data on the disk. So, we'll have a a quick look at some uh, uh, configuration and what actually impacts performance uh, when you configure uh, your MISP instance and how you should view and set the different hardware settings when you plan to install a MISP instance. So these are the factors that impact the performance on your MISP instance. So first of all is clustering of the data. So what it means by data point per event, it means how many attributes Per event you you will create. So if you remember, this is quite nice when you have events that contain, like in this case, uh, some attributes. In this case, we have 20, 60, and so on. But you don't need to be shy about it. You can bump this number up to the few thousands of attributes per event. It's not a big deal. But the, the, the thing is, if you decide to use MISP just as a database and only create one event that contains millions and millions of attributes, this is where you can impact performance a lot. So it's better if you cluster your data uh, by uh, uh, event. So now you might think, okay, but I have this feed uh, that I'm getting and this feed is huge. It has half a billion of attributes and there is no no way for me to like cluster it. When I pull this feed, it just creates one big event with half a billion of attributes. So how can I do this? How can I solve that issue? And the, the solution that we recommend for that is to make the clusterization yourself. That means you would, for example, create uh, like 10 or 100 events and you would put these attributes inside these events. Um, or if you have huge feeds like this, uh, where you can do the uh, the clustering based on time, for example, day one, day two, day three, and so on, it's also a better way to, to do it that way. Because, uh, well, if you have to load the entire event in your memory, uh, that can be a huge performance drop. So if you have good clustering of your data, it will be a, a huge gain for you. Now, the second factor that was there at the time, uh, but nowadays is less relevant, is correlation. Because before, you had to block elements that you didn't want to correlate manually. But now we have introduced a system that automatically um, adds some kind of block list on the element to avoid them to over-correlate. Um, so nowadays, it's less of an issue. But the third point is actually interesting. Uh, so we recommend to, come to add context, like to add a lot of context to your event. And we even recommend to add context on attributes when it makes sense. But when, when you start to over contextualize, this is where you can slow down uh, your instance in general. What I mean by over contextualizing, uh, let's take, uh, nah, doesn't matter. let's take an event. You see, we have added TLP green on the event. If you start to add TLP green on every attribute in that event, uh, this is what I would call over, over contextualization. 
because you can just benefit in the, the fact that tags on the event level propagate to the lower level, which is attributes. And so if you just attach a tag on the event level, you will basically save, I don't know how many attributes there are. One, two, three. There are, let's say, there are 30 attributes in this event. You would save 30 entries in your database. So it doesn't sound a lot like this, but when you scale that to a huge production system where you have uh, thousands of uh, millions of attributes, then it really matters. Um, yeah. So try not to over contextualize or at least make the contextualization clever. Um, so now another aspect. So we've considered a factor that may impact performance. Uh, um, yeah, actually that's the next slide. Yeah, sorry. So to continue on the factors that actually impact performance is the number of users that are active at any given time. Um, obviously that depends on how you consider the usage of your instance. If you just, just your team has access to that instance and it's three people, then that's not something that you have to think about. If it's a, a hub instance where you will give access to many partners that will do a lot of export, that's something obviously that you have to think about. But I, I think it's uh, it's just common sense that if you give access to many users that might perform a lot of field queries, um, well, the system might suffer. And so you should uh, provision it accordingly. Another aspect is the logging strategy. I've mentioned it quickly uh, before. So what I mean by logging strategy is we have the option to have the paranoid logging in MISP uh, that allows you to be extremely verbose in the logs where you would see any action done by any user on the instance, uh, including the payload uh, that they sent, any page that they visit, you will get it, any resource they access, you will get them in the logs. So that can be useful in some cases, uh, but if you choose that logging strategy, uh, you will fill your disk quite fast. So that's something also to keep in mind. And last but not least, and this goes well with the first one that we saw, uh, like the number of users, is how many, how are users going to use your API? If they are going to use heavy searches, like, like it says on the slide, substring searches uh, on the huge data set that will obviously introduce a lot of overheads, a lot of processing time. And so if you have that type of users that execute these heavy queries or heavy searches on a regular basis, then you need to scale the system accordingly. Now, we saw the, the factor that might impact the performance, but what are the factors that do not impact the performance? So that might be a bit counterintuitive, but using warning lists doesn't impact performance at all. So to have this notice, I don't know if we have one or this one. Uh, so I will quickly create one so that everyone knows what I'm talking about. Okay, so these warnings, like this one, this IP says that uh, we have a warning from the list of don't IPv4 public DNS resolver, and we have the warning there. These warnings, they are almost they almost introduce is no cost uh, to the system. So using them is, first of all, heavily encouraged because you might reduce false positive by a nice factor, uh, especially that they don't impact performance that much. Next, the second point is the number of attributes on the instance. Um, so you see the distinction. If you have a lot of attributes in an instance, it's uh, usually... I mean, unless you're talking about thousands of billions, but it usually doesn't impact performance that much. It's all a matter of clustering these attributes. So if you cluster them uh, sanely, like uh, have a, uh, something like less than the hundreds of thousands of attributes per event, then it's going to be okay. And the number, the raw number of attributes on the instance doesn't have a huge impact. Uh, again, the number of sync connection uh, doesn't really impact the performance. Like what I mean by sync connection is these ones. Um, if you try to pull or push to this instance 
every minute, it won't impact performance that much. Because those, the, the way synchronization work, in MISP we have some kind of incremental strategy where we will only download and synchronize um, the differences that we detect between the two instances. So if uh, every, sing every, every minute you try to synchronize with another instance, uh, well, the synchronization will not do like a lot of work on MISP side, a lot of processing time on MISP side, uh, because it will like collect the differences, see that nothing changed since the last minute, and so it won't do uh, like much work. But we still specify with measures, so please don't try to synchronize every second. Uh, there is no point in doing that. And finally, we have uh, what we call automation channels or pub sub channels that we will have a look at in like one hour. And uh, so these channel, subscribing to these channels and using them to automate stuff, uh, well, it's barely has any cost on this side. Now, talking about authentication, and that's a question we regularly have during trainings, there are many ways to provide authentication. The default way, which is the one you've been using so far, is to use the combination of username and password. <clears throat> But you also have other like plugins or built-in modules that have been contributed by third parties. So we are not using these. We are not users of these uh, authentication uh, uh, plugins. Uh, but we know they are used. Uh, they're being used in the wild and they're being maintained by third parties. Um, when, for example, the LDAP, this is a request uh, uh, that was asked yesterday during the training. And of course, we have LDAP integration. Uh, Shibolet, uh, OpenID, Active Directory, and so on. Um, we also have what we call uh, the Poor Man OTP, also called Email OTP. It's uh, a system that you can enable in your MISP instance. It's really straightforward. We have two kind of OTPs in MISP. The first one, uh, which is the Poor Man OTP, when you enable it, uh, it will send a token to user that tries to log in. And users will have to like prove uh, that they have access uh, and uh, to their mails by just copy pasting the token into the web interface. And that's the simplest way to have uh, the email OTP and doesn't require you to install any dependencies. We also have a different kind of OTP for TOTP, but for this one you have to install uh, the dependencies, the PHP dependencies. And this one basically generates a QR code that you would have to use, scan using an authentication app, or authenticator app like the Google one or the Microsoft one. Um, and once you have scanned it, you will have like time token that you have uh, to enter in your MISP instance. Uh, like, I mean, it's pretty, pretty, standard in, pretty standard in the industry. So we have the two systems that are built in. Uh, one of them is straightforward and doesn't require you to install any dependencies. And the other one is straightforward, but you have to like install the dependency. All right. So a bit of tuning. And even though we've covered that a bit in the diagnostic page, uh, I mean, we can talk about it once more. So PHP tuning. Um, MISP is quite different in regular web application where typically re regular web application that tend to served a lot of page quickly, like you would have a lot of uh, very few uh, simple and light requests. Um, but in the case of MISP, it's quite the opposite. In MISP, you don't have a lot of requests. You have like few heavy uh, requests. So you have to, to keep that in mind and tune your PHP and database system based on, on that consideration. So usually when you install MISP, it sets the, well, it tries at least to, to set the correct uh, setting. But if uh, you want to improve performance, increasing the, the maximum memory, memory usage per process uh, might give you some uh, nice benefits. Same for timeouts. Um, it says on the slide, consider setting it per walls. And what it means by that is if you remember from the previous section, 
In MISP, you can create roles and you can also assign the memory limit and the max execution time. Um, so this is a way for you to override what has been defined in your PHP configuration file on the fly based on the role. So we heavily encourage you to like set these based on roles. Typically, if you have uh, users that know you would perform API queries, like heavy API queries, what you could do is to, for example, create an API user and instead of setting a memory limit of two gigs, you could put something like four gigs, double the execution time, but put, uh, put um, uh, a rate limit on the amount of queries that I can do per 15 minutes. For example, you could say that you can only do 10 queries per 15 minutes. So you have additional resources to use, but you can only use them uh, like sparsely. Um, all right, then MySQL, uh, yeah, in the diagnostic page, you have a dedicated section for database for tuning that provides recommended value. Have a look at that. Uh, and yeah, as it says on the slides, just keep in mind that you have to tune things for um, heavy queries rather than many light ones. Um, for avail availability, uh, well, you can also... It's a, it's a typical LAMP uh, application. So you have uh, an Apache server with a uh, MySQL database behind. So you can obviously do load balancing, you can do database uh, replication, mirroring, and so on. Uh, we don't do that. It's up to you to, to do all of that. Just if you introduce load balancing, just keep in mind that uh, session pinning is important. And also something else about the storage. So it says storage can be abstracted. Uh, abstracted. What I mean by that is most of the information are stored in the database, but there is only one thing that is not stored in the database, and it is, and I don't see it. I don't have it there. It is files, so attachments. It's a shame. Ah, this one. So these files, they are not stored in the database. They are stored on the, the local storage, so on the on the file system. And so if you do like uh, load balancing and uh, database uh, mirroring and so on, you also have to uh, take special care that these files, they are all accessible from everywhere. Okay, so if you want to see uh, a very good presentation on how uh, load balancing and uh, disaster recovery was implemented for AWS, you can have a look at this uh, GitHub repository. Uh, it, it's a very good uh, presentation. Uh, it has nice documentation and it also has a, a video. I think it's like a 30 minute video that explain and show you how to use that. And with that, that's basically it for the deployment. Now we will have a look at integration. And with that, we will start with the CLI integration. CLI automation. So I've, I've already showed you this page, the automation page. So when you click on this one, you have a lot of information. Oops. You have a lot of information in there. Uh, what we are interested is what is defined at the bottom. That tells you how you can administer your MISP instance via the command line interface. For example, if you want to access the settings uh, using the CLI, you just need to run this command and you will get the setting. setting. So it's an example. I have access, I have a MISP installed on that uh, on that server. So if I want to access to get the value of one setting, I'm just calling the admin binary and I pass the get setting parameter. And this one expect the name of the setting for which I want to get the value. So how can I get the value of a setting? Simply go to settings and then just take one, this one, this base URL. You do this and then MISP will reply with the configuration of that setting. So you have the small description, you have the actual value that is being set for that setting, the name of the setting and so on. So this one is not really set, that's why it's red. But if we take this one, uh, 
Oh, this one is not either. Uh, but you, you quickly get the idea. So you can do that for like a lot of settings. Any any of them actually. It can be a MISP setting, but it can also be a security setting. It can be a plugging setting. So if you want to check if the enrichment system is running or not, you can simply do the, the get setting like this. Now that you know how to use the CLI, we'll quickly get uh, that it's uh, fairly easy to use the other ones. So if I want to set a setting instead of get setting, I just use set setting, provide the name of the setting and simply the value that I want to change. Um, I can get a note key for a user. I can change an authorization key. I can change the password. Remember, if you lose the admin access uh, of your... Oops. If you lose the admin password of your MISP instance. Uh, quite easy. Go there. Change password. Take it. Use the user uh, scope, the change password action, and then you just provide the email address and the new password. You press enter and that's it, you will change the password of your user. I've already mentioned that you can update your MISP instance using the CLI. Just need to call this. So if you want to be crazy, you can put this command in the cron jump. So you have an automatic update of your MISP instance. Um, yeah, so we can do, so you can administer your MISP, you can automate uh, different tasks. So for synchronization, I showed you how you can pull and how you can push. But these tasks, they are not done automatically by your MISP instance. You can do it manually, but that's really something that you don't want to do, especially if you want to pull every day. So for that, the best way to do things, especially pull or push, is to use these commands. Like in this case, it would be a server pull and put this command in a cron job. Same for push, if you want to push, simply use this command and pull that in a cron job. So, and basically that's how people have synchronization running every day or you can execute it every hour if you want. So you can do that for synchronization, but you can also do that for feeds. So if you want to cache the Tor exit node feed, uh, where is it? Cache server. Thank you, cache, feed cache. So it's this one. This one you just thank you. Uh, so that each time this is run, it will cache the feed you provide. Uh, we can also play a bit with uh, the data so we can publish the event, we can send emails, we can send uh, uh, alert emails, we can run enrichment on event. And last but not least, you can also manage the worker, the background workers. Um, so something that uh, people also usually do, I mentioned already that workers, they might sometimes be stuck. So it's a good thing to like monitor the status of your workers. Sorry. So with this, I can monitor the status. I can see that, uh, oh, this one may not be okay. So this one I may need to like uh, uh, restart. And so what people usually do, they monitor this. And if there is one worker that is down or if many workers for a spe specific queue uh, are down, they just restart all worker for that queue. And we have a very nice blog post about it uh, where it explains quickly how we monitor some of our mis misp instances and how we have some kind of uh, um, automatic recovery, especially regarding workers. Uh, and I'm sure one of my colleagues will, will paste uh, the link of that uh, nice blog post in the chat. I wasn't even, I didn't even finish my sentence that it was already done. So see, it's perfect. All right, so that's it for CLI automation. Now let's have a look at the API. So how you can interact with MISP, but not using the user interface.
Okay. So for that, I will be using um, a Jupyter notebook. Um, so that all my uh, different queries are already in cells that I can quickly execute. Um, so I will even clear them all. Um, they changed, ah, clear. Um, so even though that might look like Python, I'm not actually not doing any Python in there. It's just that I'm doing something that you would have like a curl call or W get call. Um, but I'm just using Python to parse the result and to print it nicely. Um, okay. Um, so this, this, uh, Jupyter, uh, notebook, you can also find it on, uh, on GitHub and I'm sure so. Someone of my colleague will paste the link of that uh, notebook so that if you want to try it out, or even if you just want to, to see the different things that you can do with the API, you can have a look at it. So before we start, if you want to use the MISP API, you have to prove that you have uh, the authorization uh, and that you have access to, that, uh, to, that, to, to the API, basically. So to do that, you have to generate an API key. So... What I will do is to generate an API key for myself. So to do that, you go on global action in my profile. This is something that you can also do with your organ min user. So if you want to play with the API as well, you can also do it this way. So you go in global action, my profile. You open up the old key panel. And you click on add authentication key. And there you can provide a command that will be assigned to the, this API key. So if I used, um, um, I don't know, key for Jupyter Notebook. You can also list all the IPs that are allowed uh, to use that API key. You can even put an expiration date. I will not do it. You click on Submit. You copy that API key because this is the only time where it will be shown on screen. I will copy it, take it, so that if I lose it, at least I still have it somewhere. And that's it. Now, if I open it up, I can see part of my key and the comment, All right? This you cannot recover anymore. So if you lost it, then you need to delete it or just create a new one. Uh, side notes about deletion of API keys and users. This is not the recommended way to do things. If you want to remove a user or remove an API key, the best practice practices are to simply disable the user and disable the API key. And the way to disable an API key is just to put an expiration date that is in the past. And for the user, you simply uh, check that box, immediately disable this user account. So that for auditability, uh, it's way better to do it that way than removing uh, the actual user. All right, so I have my API key. This is good. But what I will show you is if you don't have the uh, Jupyter Notebook installed or if you don't have... Uh, access to a curl a client or whatever, you can still try the API the API of MISP by using the built-in REST client that we have in the application. So for that, you go in the API REST client. And this is a simple client that you can use to perform queries on your MISP instance. So let's just show you a small example. So if I want to get the version of the server, I just would do a slash server slash get version, choose the get HTTP method, check the show result. If I want, I can bookmark it and it will be added in the, the table in there, but I don't want to bookmark it. In the authorization header, you put the API key and that's it. You run the query and you will get the reply. So you have the response header, the time it took to perform that query and then the, the actual body. So we can see that we have the version, we have uh, the recommended PyMIS version, a different 
a permission that are returned. Something that is very nice with that REST client is that you can convert the, the query I just did into a curl command or a bimisp uh, script. So if I click on curl, it generates for me a curl command that I can simply take, open a shell, paste it, and run it. And like this, I immediately have access to the API, so I can just play and I can put that in a cron job or do whatever I want. Same for PyMisp, that we will see uh, later on, but you can basically take this Python code, execute it, and the result of that direct call will be exactly this outcome. All right, so let's have a quick look at the API, what you can do. So we'll take, once again, the API key, and we'll put it there. Uh, I need to put the correct URL. There we go. I will take and put the API on the side and put MISP on the other side. Okay. Let's undo a bit. So what can you do with the API? Well, most easiest one would be to create an event. To create an event, simply use the event slash add endpoint. You provide the needed info for the needed uh, data for that event. In this case, we set the title to be this one. We set the distribution to be zero. And then you execute that command. So let's do it and let's see what we get. So as a reply, you see we have the event, the complete event. We can get its UID that was generated by MISP. We can see that the organization that was assigned is org name. We can see that it doesn't have any attribute nor objects and a lot of other information. And now if I reload on the right side, we can see our event that was just created. Now you might be wondering, okay, that's great, uh, but you are cheating. You knew that uh, this is events and that it accepts this kind of parameter. How, as a, as a newcomer, how do I know this, all of this information? But don't worry, we got you covered. If you go in API and open API, you have access to the open API specification in your MISP instance, but you also have access to the API specification in the MISP project.org. Um, and it's somewhere, I don't remember documentation most probably, and you have access to the open API on our website. And in there you have everything you need. So for example, add event. You go in there, you see uh, what it needs, the different uh, parameter it accepts. Info, for example, the timestamp, uh, the distribution level, for example, there. So you saw that I use distribution zero. And if you look at the open API specification, you see that zero corresponds to your organization only. And with that, in, in this interface, you get also a sample of what a full request might look like and the sample of one, what a response uh, might look like. So very good uh, API documentation in there. So what else can we do? Well, we can change uh, anything related to an event. For example, we have this event and I can simply call event slash edit slash 68, 68 that I've put in the relative path. So I'm curious how I do this. I just concatenate these two strings in, the, in just below. Uh, and this time we are changing the distribution from zero, which corresponds to org only, to all communities. And so when I executed this, you can we can check that the distribution was indeed updated. You can also add attributes. Um, there are two ways to add attributes. You can either call the attribute slash add endpoint uh, that we will see a few cells below. But you can also do it in a way that you are editing an event by providing data related to, to the attribute. This is not really the standard way to add attribute using the API. The standard way is to use 
the attribute slash add endpoint. So for this one, you simply need to specify to which event ID you want to add your attribute to. Because you remember from yesterday, attributes are always contained uh, inside one event. So if I want to add an attribute to that event, I just take the ID of that event and I call slash attribute slash add slash the event ID. So what I'm doing, I'm creating an attribute of type IP destination with that value. As a reply, I get my full attribute. And if I reload the page, we can see our attribute that was created. So similar to what we did previously, if you try to create an attribute and the validation is, is not a success, so in this case, I'm trying to add an IP of type MD5. This is obviously not an MD5 uh, type. Uh, then I get an error, which is expected. So you get everything that you need. Similar to event, you can edit attributes. You can also add objects. So it's a bit more complex to add objects because you have a lot of, of uh, stuff to provide. But for that specific aspect, it's better to use PyMisp uh, because PyMisp offers you a lot of helpers to actually like create an object, modify it, and so on. You can play with event reports. Uh, you can create analyst nodes. So in this case, you can also add uh, oops, an analyst node to anything. So in this case, I can add this analyst node to the attribute. Now, if we reload the page, we can see our beautiful node. I can do the same for opinion. You can also search for data. Remember the index search that we've covered with this magnifying glass? Well, all the parameters, they are exposed. And you can uh, use them uh, in this fashion. So in this case, I'm searching for all events that have API in their... Uh, like uh, ah, there we go uh, searching any event that have API in their title that were published since this date and that were created by this organization if I do that I can see that I don't have any because even though this one has API in its name this one is not published if I publish it now I have my event. Okay. So last uh, thing that I want to show using the API is REST search. Uh, so REST search is basically the most powerful search tool that you have in MISP. Uh, this is where you will extract information to feed to different tools, uh, especially that you can provide the format um, that should be used and th that you want to have as an export. So by default, we have JSON. Um, so if I'm doing this, oh, that's already there. So if I'm calling attributes slash research with a written format of JSON, and I'm forcing the event to be exported to be this one, I will get the result all the attributes that are contained in, the, in this event under the JSON format, right? Um, but you can be even do even more stuff. You can filter based on the type. So in this in this case, I'm asking any attribute from that event that are the, of type IP dest. If I were to put IP source, I wouldn't get any. For the value, you can also say that you want any attribute that start with 8.8. .8 and then a wildcard operator. That's why we have that. So you can see you can be a bit creative with substring searches. Um, and something also important, because it's usually how you do the, uh, uh, the filtering, is when you use tags. So if I want to export not this one, not like this one. Give me green. Okay. 
So if I want to export all attributes that are tagged with TLP white, I can do this. I don't have any. This is because it's tagged with TLP green. But if I select TLP green, of course, I will get this one. So these tags, they work both on the attribute and event level. So if instead we have TLP, uh, TLP, TLP clear, let's take TLP version two. Uh, if we have TLP clear like this, you see, I still have the attribute because the event is tagged TLP clear. Even though the attribute is untagged, TLP clear as the event is tagged, we still have the, the result. Okay, last point that I want to cover with research um, is the pagination. So in this case, I only exported a subset of the data because I was forcing the event uh, to be this one. If I were to comment this, what I will ask to MISP right now is to export me all the attributes of the system without restriction in JSON. So what would happen if I do this? I have almost 600 attributes. That's not a lot, but keep in mind, this is a training instance. If that would be a production instance where, would ha where we would have um, half a billion attributes in there, we can quickly realize that this is not going to work. Like something is going to time out. So the correct way to extract that many attributes, if you need to, is to use what we call pagination. So you would say, specify how many elements you want to retrieve and at which page it should start. So in this case, by specifying this, I get 10 attributes on page one. And then once it's done, I can request the next page. And you continue like this until you don't get any attribute. And then you know that you are done. All right. I've mentioned that research is very powerful because you can also convert into different formats. And so I have example there, for example, CSV. So if I want to export data under CSV, I just need to use a different return format. There. Almost there. There we go. So we have different formats. You can have a look at uh, the Open API specification, but we have some uh, like CSV, we have sticks, uh, we have JSON, of course, we have Suricata, we have uh, Yara. In some cases, we have Bro and IDS. Uh, well, we have many formats. All right, so that, that's it for a quick introduction about the MISP API. Now we'll have a similar concept, still using the API, but this time using PyMISP, so the Python wrapper that we have for MISP. And the nice thing when you are using PyMISP is that you don't always need a connection to a MISP instance. Um, what you can do is simply create data in your uh, script, like uh, create an event, add attribute to that event, add object to that event, tag your event. And once you have constructed all of this information in the context of your script, you can finally push that information to a MISP instance. And that's way faster to do it that way. Imagine uh, you have to add 10 attributes to an event. If you were to perform 10 calls, on uh, the MISP uh, API, that includes 10 times you will authenticate using the API key, 10 times you will uh, run all the ACL to check that you have the right to actually create that attribute and so on. This is really a lot of resources spent for, I would say, nothing. But if you do it differently, like you create your event and then you push these 10 attributes in one shot to MISP, you will only do these checks once and it will really speed up, uh, like, the automation part that you are setting up. So that's uh, the preferred way to use the MISP API is to use PyMISP. And this is what we will see how you can use a different element like this. So now it's Python. I hope 
you are all familiar with Python, otherwise it can be a bit rough, but I, I think it's pretty straightforward uh, if you've done a bit of programming before. So what we are doing, we are simply in this case importing the misbevent class uh, and creating an empty misbevent. Then we assign some information about that event. So in this case, we assign the title of that event, uh, the distribution, the analysis, and so on. And we just print it. So if I run this, uh, oops. Um, what do we have there? Okay, no model name, PyMisp. Looks like I never imported PyMisp. Uh, hold on. Because I really want to show it to you. Which one is it? I think it's this one. There we go. Okay. So this is what was created by PyMisp. So it automatically generated a new UID and then assign in anything that we define above to our event. We can also decide to add a tag to this event. So if I do this, you can see that now we've added a tag. Keep in mind, we are still working in the script. So in the context of that execution, nothing has been sent to MISP yet. This is a step that we will do at the end. We can change the date of that event. We can add attribute to an event. If we call the function add attribute, where we pass a type and a value, then we can simply like this, uh, add an attribute to our event. So we call this. You see that what is being returned by that function is actually the misp attribute that was created with that value. But it's still, if we print the JSON version of that event. Ah, because I recreated everything. This was not clever. Um, but if I were to to if I were were to to print that uh, that event, you would see uh, the attribute that has been added. Uh, yeah, you can add more attributes. Uh, you can even modify attribute that were added just before. So this one was added at that line, and then we can change the state of the ideas flag. Similar to the event, you can also tag attributes. So in this case, I'm taking, accessing the, the event, all the attributes of my event. I'm taking the first one in the list, and I'm, I'm attaching the tag TLP grid. But you can also it, uh, do it the other way around. So by calling the add attribute function, I got an attribute back. And you can simply call that add tag function on the return attribute. So if I do this, now you can see my second attribute got the tag till pmber attached to it. We've talked about soft deletion. You can also doing do it by just calling the delete function. You can publish an event by calling the publish function on it. Um, yeah, so see, it's pretty straightforward. Now for objects. I told you that uh, dealing with objects using the raw MISP API can be quite a challenge, uh, but with PyMISP, it's much straightforward. Uh, so in this case, let's go line by line what's going on. This circle at, it's uh, simply uh, just a regular attribute. Then this misp object, you see, we call the misp object uh, uh, class. We provide the name of the object, and we pass a list of uh, attributes that will be added to that uh, uh, to that object. Then we change the comment of that object. We add another attribute to that object. In this case, we are adding a domain. 
we are adding a tag to that uh, second attribute. And then we add three more attributes, one of type IP, a first scene and a last scene. And as the last step, no, so we've created this object with many attributes. And the last step is to add that object to our event. And finally, we print the event. So let's see what we have there. That's a lot of stuff. So this is our complete event that we've created so far with all the attributes that we added above. And if we look, we will see the object, all the objects that are inside this event. And in this one, you, we have a lot of stuff there. These are all the objects, but we actually only have one. And, and there we have all the attributes, all the attributes that we added in, in there. So you also have other version on how to add the things, but I will let you have a look at it later on if you, if you are interested. And yeah, I think that covers most of the stuff I wanted to, to show you about the MISP uh, API using PyMISP, at least without interaction with the, with the MISP instance. Because now that we've created all of this data, we can finally push it to MISP, right? Because right now it's still in the context of the execution of our script. Uh, but if we want to actually push it to a MISP instance so that it's saved on a MISP instance, uh, that's an operation that we need to do. And to do that, you have to call this function, add event. But first, what is this MISP there? The MISP there is basically the client that you instantiate where you provide the, the URL of the MISP instance, your authorization key. So that's what I will do quickly. Authorization key, that's the one I generated before. <clears throat> the URL of my MISP instance is basically this one. So create that, create that. And now what is going to happen in this case, we'll create an event, set different fields, create a, a file object, add an attribute with a tag to that object, add that object to the event, and finally add that event to MISP. So let's execute this. Let's reload. And now we can see we have a new event. This is my new MISP event. See, this is the title that we've assigned. And if you open it up, we can see that we have indeed the file object with the attribute and the tag. See how easy it was to create data using PyMISP? Is that very nice? What we can do after all of this is to update data. So in this case, I'm creating a new file. I'm adding a new attribute, uh, adding that object to the existing event, existing event that was uh, assigned there and I'm updating it. So if I go back, I reload, and you can see my second object with my new tag. All right. So yeah, you can do a bunch of stuff. You can fetch events from your MISP, you can modify them, update them, propose attributes, and so on and so forth. You can also manage organization, manage users, manage sharing groups. Well, basically anything that you can do using the, the user interface, you can do using the API. All right. So for the next 15 minutes, a bit more about automation and workflows. So for automation, I will get rid of this. Get rid of this. this and for this one I will actually use my development instance it will be slightly easier for me okay so in MISP we have um, the concept of uh, pub sub channels and that's a topic I've already brought up 
when we were going through the settings. If we go in plugins, you can see that we have Kafka and Zero MQ. These are pub sub channels. What I mean by pub sub channels, it means we have a publisher, uh, so um, an application that produces data and then publish it um, onto uh, that channel. And we can also have subscriber, so that could be, for example, a script that subscribe to that channel and consume these messages. So in this case, I've enabled the zero MQ uh, channel. And uh, yeah, let's see, let's see what it does actually. So for that, I will access my MISP instance. Uh, if you go in app, just tools, sorry. Then this ZMQ. We have uh, some samples uh, that allows us to simply subscribe to that channel and print any messages uh, on the terminal. Just enabling a virtual environment, starting the script. And now anything that happened on the zero MQ channel of MISP, of my MISP instance, uh, it will be printed in the terminal. So by default, you have some kind of heartbeat messages that simply like keep the connection alive. But if I start to explore the application, you can see that I have the paranoid logging active for, uh, for my instance. So any anytime I, I access something, it will be displayed there. And if I do, for example, a small modification, you can see that a lot of stuff is going on. So I have all the audits, uh, all the data that was created uh, is also reflected onto that channel. It's a bit difficult to parse because we have a lot of information. Maybe I should have disabled the parent logging so that would be easier to see. Uh, this one, this one is interesting. Oops. So we can see the 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 event has been sent to the to the onto the channel. And what you can do using this pub sub system is that you can subscribe it and consume messages. And when you see something that uh, could be used as a trigger or entry point to run a script, then you run it. So we know some organizations uh, that are using that so that they have some kind of real time uh, event logs. Like when I mean events, it's not a misp event. It's like events or something that happens in the system. And so they consume it. And for example, when they see that a new event or a new attribute has been created, they perform operation, operations such as a, a curation or enrichment. So that's the kind of thing that you can do. But that requires you first of all to subscribe to the zero MQ channel and then to write some Python code. And subscribing to that channel is really, really straightforward. You simply take uh, that blueprint. So this is the code. See, it's not much. And uh, the only thing that you have to do is implement this function, handle message. So this function will receive and be executed uh, every time a message is sent uh, on that channel. And you simply have to, to parse the topic and to parse the message. And if it matches what you expect, then you trigger and you run additional actions. So that's one of the way where you can provide automation, like automatic automation uh, uh, that in MISP. But we have another way, which is depending on how you view things, which can be more user-friendly and it's called the MISP workflow. So this one I will switch back to our training instance. If you go on administration workflows, um, you have a list of um, all the workflows that you execute. And maybe something that I can do is to quickly present you what actually this system is, what you can do with it, and then I will show it live in the application. So I will, I will go quickly through some slides so that you understand what, uh, what we are talking about. So the main idea of the workflow is to have some kind of visual data flow programming 
where you drag and drop boxes, uh, and that way you configure your workflow and how it should be run. And MISP automatically will execute that workflow for you when specific conditions are met. So what kind of use case can the MISP workflow system support and what are the intents? Typical use case involve notification when specific action happens. For example, if a new event matches a criteria, like if a new event has a TLP red tag attached to it, you can send notification. Each time a new user login or each time a new user is created, you want to greet him, you can send a notification. If you want to get automated alert when you have like high priority IOCs that arrive in the system, you can create this notification. So this is one type of use case. Another one would be to actually extend uh, typical misbehavior. For example, to relay or to push data to another system. If you have an elastic search and you want to push tons of stuff to elastic search, elastic search, you could use that system to push it that way. You can use that system to perform automatic enrichment of whatever is coming in. You can prevent false positives. You can do some sanity checks and curation with that system. It's quite easy to do. And the last use case uh, that we consider, well, last, there are many more, but that is the, the principal ones. Uh, or the hooks capability. So if you need to have something like a webhook uh, or to assign uh, and do case management, uh, well, you can use that system to do that. So how does it work behind the scene? Uh, it basically follows this really simplistic concept where first of all, you have an event that happens in MISP. So anything that could happen in MISP, like an event is created, an attribute is uh, changed, uh, user login. These are what we call events. Then we check for some condition. So if, for example, the event is tagged with TLP red, and then we execute an action. So for example, we send an email. So what kind of event do we support? Uh, I've mentioned a few. So a new event, attribute has been saved, a new user is created. Uh, so these are the kind of events that we support. And this event in the application, we call them triggers. So that's just terminology. Mm -hmm. Then for the condition, what kind of condition uh, can we express? For example, we can check at the tags. Uh, we can check on the distribution level. We can check uh, who created that data. And there is also a way to encode generic condition, which is uh, less uh, drag and drop. You have to just write uh, a small path and how it should be evaluated. Uh, but basically, you can express any condition that you want. <laughs> and those, uh, those conditions, we call them logic modules. And this is what they look like in the interface. Uh, we call them modules because it's like a box that you can connect and link and chain together. And now finally, the action. Uh, what kind of action can you do using that system? Uh, I've mentioned sending emails, uh, performing enrichment, but you can also modify data, such as attaching tags. And we call them action modules uh, because similar to the logic modules, you can also chain them together. And these are boxes that you can link. So this one is an example where we send uh, an email to all accounts uh, with the following subject and the following body. And that's it. This is what a workflow looks like. So you have the entry points, so the trigger, then optionally some condition, and finally an action. Uh, skipping most of the stuff because it's not really that interesting. And let's have, a, let's have a look at what we have in the interface. So when you go on administration and then workflows, you will see the list of triggers that are available. Right now in my system, I don't have any trigger enabled. So let's quickly activate one. Let's activate the event publish. So now anytime an event is about to be published, the workflow will execute. I will quickly just enable some modules. All right. So now let's see what we can do. So how you can how we can create a workflow. To do that, you just click on this uh, edit associated workflow, and you have this editor interface that allows you to drag and drop boxes and create your workflow. For example, 
if we want to check if a tag is present on an event, we go in the logic section, drag and drop the tag. We link these two boxes together. So now each time an event is published, we will check for that condition. We we'll check that the event is tagged with, let's say, TLP, uh, TLP green. Just gonna save. And so based on that, now we can choose to execute an action. So in this case, if the event is tagged with TLP green, we can choose to execute action if this condition evaluates to true, or we can choose to execute action if this condition evaluates to false. So we could do something a bit weird, but we can still do it. We could say that any event that are tagged with TLP green should not be published. So basically we stop the execution of both the workflow, but also of the original action. So in this case, event publish. And in the other case, we could say that, okay, if the event is not tagged with TLP green, uh, we could send a message to Mattermost. So I don't have a Mattermost uh, uh, bot active, so that won't do anything, uh, but you get the idea. So we can even say to send mail. Send mail, this is not too bad. So with that, we can send mail to all admins and we can say that uh, event published. And we could even uh, say that the event with title, event title has been published. Oops, we save. And now what's gonna happen, and each time an event with TLP green uh, is about to be published, if, it's, if it has TLP green, then the publication won't happen. And if it doesn't, then we will send the mail. But let's 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 try and let's see if it works. So let's take this event that we created. Let's add the TLP green tag. And now let's hope that the demo works. Let's try to publish it. It says job queued. And see, I'm reloading, reloading, reloading. The event is not getting published. And if I look at the logs of that workflow, we can see that the workflow was executed and that uh, the execution was stopped with the message execution stopped. This is the message that we added there. Now let's try to remove the TP green tag. And let's try to publish again. And now we can see the event was published. And if you look at the logs, no errors. All right. So that was a really, really quick introduction of the MISP workflow system. There are many more features and stuff you can do with that system. So if you're interested, I really advise you uh, or to, to look uh, some of the video we've posted online or even the, the slide deck dedicated to that, uh, to that topic. Um, because yeah, for example, uh, things like blueprints, I didn't cover them today, but you can have uh, many blueprints that we actually even uh, offer by default on any MISP application. So we have huge curation blueprints uh, that you can use right away in your system, so just to, to show you how quickly what it would look like. So for example, uh, one that has an integration with uh, Abuse IPDB. This is a big blueprint that does a lot of things. Uh, but basically this one's uh, it will run enrichment for any uh, IPs. And if they are known in the abuse IPDB database, it will mark them as uh, either true positive or false positives accordingly and automatically change the state of the IDS flag so that you avoid any false positive based on the abuse IPDB uh, service. Uh, we also have all the... Uh, concept of uh, generic condition, parallel execution, uh, and so on. So, yeah, a lot of uh, really interesting content if you are interested in that uh, 
in that topic. And that brings us to the end of that uh, training. So thank you very much for uh, attending today's session. Uh, if you have any question, continue uh, to ask them in the chat. And with that, I wish you a very good, uh, well, depending on the time zone, so morning, afternoon, or evening. Thank you everyone for attending and see you soon. Bye-bye.